Thank you. Thank you. For this. That's really inspiring. And uh, actually, um, the, the sentence on uh, our poster that encouraging the most, like the most the challenging moment that actually defined us. So actually, I think we need to practice our muscles spiritually, emotionally, and physically so that we can have that courage. So I think uh, there's a, a other people like uh, Qian Jian, right? Uh, he gonna ask another question. So uh, so I'll give time to Qian Jian. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a lovely story. And you're such an amazing uh, storyteller, Luis, that uh, I thoroughly enjoyed your TED talk. And I've shared that with many people uh, before. I, I saw that actually a couple of years ago. Uh, when we were in Vancouver and uh, delivering a TED talk on US China. Uh, so, I just a couple of uh, background about what I'm doing for uh, climate change, and uh, then I will pose a question. Uh, I actually just finished a uh, discussion with Kevin Rudd, uh, who I have been working with for the past six years, with uh, George Papandreou about uh, two hours ago on EU China US uh, climate collaboration. So in my daytime job, I uh, do a lot of private diplomacy uh, between US and China. We're preparing uh, Biden administration, both the UNs, in November to restart the uh, procedure to get US back to Paris and also to uh, restore the US-China collaboration on climate because that's basically uh, it. It has to be uh, redone. And uh, John Podestas on the US side and Xie Zhenghua from the China side are both on our working team. So this is uh, what I want to uh, offer my help as well in terms of getting China uh, to, to, to join the agreement. You have Russia covered apparently. Uh, second thing I do in my spare time in addition to uh, helping... Thank you. Thank you. Can, uh, I, can I just jump in here and just say thank you so, so much. You know, we can create these protected areas in the Arctic and Antarctica around the world. But unless we're able to tackle climate change, unless we're able to follow that road which we, and that map and that dream which we set out in Paris a few years ago, then the protected areas won't work. We need to be doing the two together. So we need to be getting America back, onto, back into Paris. We need to get America and China really excited about the possibilities of working together, building bridges, and solving this problem together. Paris is where it starts. Exactly, and the, the political space is what we're trying to create in the past few months, right? given that uh, uh, there will be a Biden administration. Otherwise, we'll have to figure out a different ways. Maybe we'll all join you to swim. Um, the second thing, uh, background that I, I do a lot as uh, President Figueres knows is that I, I also run a, a young leaders training program called Project Agora, which trains the younger generation in China to become leaders like yourself and President Figueres to do more for SDGs in the future. So what I take from your uh, marvelous presentation, if I can read from my notes, is that you are doing something uh, you love fundamentally and passionate about to lift the bar of the impossible and to create something truly amazing and beautiful to inspire sustainable changes for intergenerational justice with a long view. So if that uh, uh, description is agreeable with you, I, I do want to ask you more about the starting point. Like how did you find your uh, true love in doing the impossible, in inspiring people by swimming and drawing attention to this? And how can we all find this passion or the calling in our lives? Because that is the most sustainable point of sustainable development, I think, is everyone have to find the personal curiosity, have to find their callings, therefore to be passionate and sustainable of the efforts lifelong. And as you said, it takes a generation. It's a great question. Um, I was very, um, I'd make a few points on this. I, I was very, very lucky. Uh, I had a, a father who was, uh, who was 50 years old when he had me. And you know, when you have a father who's so much older than you, they have a lot of perspective. So my father wasn't sort of 20 years old and 
still you know, starting out in life. He was 50 years old and, and he loved to tell me stories. So he had served in the Royal Navy. He'd been a doctor in the Royal Navy. And I grew up in this one town in Britain called Plymouth or city called Plymouth. And all the great explorers that Britain has all came from that town. So wherever I went, you could see the history of the great explorers who had found different parts of the world. So that was one aspect of it. But the second aspect is that when I was 10 years old, we moved from England out to South Africa. And at the time in South Africa, South Africa was going through enormous transformation. So South Africa was still governed by a white government, still had apartheid, Nelson Mandela was still in jail, and there was this enormous battle taking place to overthrow the government and to replace it with a government which represented the people. And I started studying law and some of my lecturers had spent time in jail and some of my lecturers were then writing the new constitution about what the laws would be, what we dreamt about, what the new country, what the values of the new country would be. And so growing up with that, you know, I was listening to all these debates about what a new South Africa would look like. So having these, you know, having a father who uh, was sharing all these wonderful stories, growing up in this, in this climate where there was so much change taking place. But lastly, uh, I've been swimming now for 33 years. And over that period of time, I've seen our oceans change completely. I mean, when I did my first swim in the Arctic, when I was swimming in the Norwegian Arctic, the first swim I did on the edge of the ice, the water was three degrees centigrade. I went back there a few years ago and the water is no longer three degrees centigrade. It's now 10 degrees centigrade in summer. So the water has gone from three to 10 in just 12 years. So you've got warm water moving up the Atlantic Ocean, moving past England, up to Norway, up against the Arctic ice pack. You don't have to be a scientist to realize, okay, that if you've got warm water moving there at 10 degrees centigrade, that ice is going to melt. And every single year, I saw the ice getting thinner and thinner. I saw glaciers retreating. In the Indian Ocean, I saw enormous changes taking place. The Indian Ocean has got some of the most incredible coral reefs you could ever imagine. But just only a few years ago, so 2007, I did a swim across the Maldives, which is a, an, a, a group of islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And I dived in, and when I start swimming, underneath me are sharks. Underneath me, small sharks, not big ones, small sharks. They're turtles, they're manta rays. There's, there's small tropical fish. Some are red and some are purple and some are blue and yellow. Every single color and description. It's like being in Hollywood. It's like being on Nemo. It is just so incredibly beautiful. I went back there just two years ago and I looked down underneath me in various, on various coral reefs. The water has warmed up just a little bit. The coral has died. The sharks have disappeared. The turtles have disappeared. The fish have disappeared. And that natural protection which that island has, has gone forever. I've been involved with a, um, a beach cleanup in Mumbai, in India, where the plastic pollution when they started was up to, our, up to our shoulders. I mean, can you imagine that we've gone to such a situation where the plastic pollution is up to your shoulders? And there comes a moment when you've got to ask yourself a very, very simple question. And that is, what am I going to do? Now, I was, I was, a, I loved swimming. I was a lawyer. As you can see, I enjoyed talking. Okay. And I said to myself, Lewis, you can't be quiet on this any longer. This is the defining issue of our generation. And, and, and so that's how I kind of found what I was meant to be doing. Now, everybody who's listening here will probably have a different thing which is their impossible and which really excites them. I don't believe that you would have a dream 
and they should also have the corresponding belief and ability to be able to achieve that dream. Now, I don't care what your dream is, whether it's to ensure that there's racial equality in the world, whether it's to ensure that there is gender equality, whether it's to ensure that there is a healthy environment or to build a big business, whatever you want to do, I don't believe you'd have a dream unless you also had that corresponding ability to achieve it. And Jose, Maria Figueres and myself, we've set out our dream. It's really clear. We want to fully protect 30% of the world's oceans. 30% of the oceans we want to protect. And we're now fixed in our mindset. And there's something very, very powerful about a made up mind. We've made up our mind that this is what we want to achieve. And we're going to get there. Bravo, bravo. Thank you very much.